Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning our gospel text is from the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1. And we will be reading and hearing together verses 21 through 28. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find this on New Testament page 33, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. And here is what it says. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I wonder, did your mother ever say any of the following to you? I could plant potatoes in those ears. Or, I'm not your maid. Or, if your friends jumped off a cliff, would you? Perhaps these phrases are familiar to you as well. Just wait till you have kids of your own. Or, don't talk with your mouth full. Or, I got this one a lot. Were you raised in a barn? And, of course, I'm sure you've heard, if not uttered, the all-time classic, because I'm your mother, that's why. Each of these statements is, in its own way, an expression that is passed from generation to generation. They are expressions of authority, the authority of a parent over a child. Authority, however, is is weaker in some people and stronger in others. Now, we have all heard parents who say things like, I really mean it this time, and we've known that it means nothing. Equally, we have heard others say simply and quietly, children come and witness an entire brood tumble into the room waiting for what's to be said next. The strength of a person's authority comes from the strength of the spirit within that person. And that spirit can be good seeking for the benefit of those around them, or it can be not so good, exercising its authority negatively, not only upon others, but also upon the person in whom that spirit resides. It just so happens that today's prescribed scripture readings are all about authority and power. The Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy concerns the authority that God will give to a prophet like Moses. The authority to speak God's word and so to lead people in righteousness. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, God says, who will speak to the people everything that I will command. And then the gospel lesson It it portrays for us the exousia, the authority 
that Jesus held, an authority that, that allowed him to command evil to depart and to teach in a manner unlike that of the scribes or anyone else for that matter. But what we sometimes forget, or what we sometimes overlook, is that as Christians, as those who follow the Christ, each one of us is granted authority to speak in God's name, to act, to do in God's name. We're called by Jesus to go out, to preach and to teach and to heal, just like Jesus. We're called to care for others and to show them God's love, just like Jesus. We're called to exemplify Christ's likeness in all of our words and in all of our actions, which is, I think, why St. Paul admonishes us to take care what we do and around whom we do it. He says we don't want to cause others to fall. Jesus even gives his followers the authority to forgive the sins of others in the name of God. Doesn't he say to Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Jesus gives to us a tremendous power, a tremendous authority. So I guess my question is, what happened to us? What happened to the church? What happened to the people of God that that so many fail to exercise this authority, this power to speak for God, to help and to heal, while others who clearly do have authority end up using it so perversely? What happened, church? A certain army colonel had been a heavy drinker for 35 years, and he was infamous for having a particularly vicious and volatile temperament. But finally, he encountered Christ, and his whole life changed. This fellow was speaking once before a group of medical people, and he told them of his personality change, how he was now temperate as he had once been intemperate, considerate as he had once been inconsiderate, concerned for others as he had once been selfish and self-serving. But a psychiatrist who believed that personalities are so firmly set so early in life that no one can change protested to the colonel that at his age a, a person couldn't possibly have had such a radical transformation. Well, replied the colonel, that may be true if I were doing it on my own, but I'm under new management. I'm under new management. That's a, that's a profound thing for the colonel to say. But But I think that's what happens to us. I think that's what happens to the average Christian who seems to have so little influence upon the lives of others, so little to say to those who are in need, so little power to affect things for the better. And what happens to make others turn into people who abuse their position? We get our management principles confused. We either don't listen for what the boss is telling us to do, or we don't do it in the way that we've been shown, or we simply don't care about the boss at all. We try to solve problems on our own power, using our own insights, our own wisdom, or, or, 
Once we see what power and authority can be like, we get carried away by it and, and use it to seek our own glory and our own prestige and so become false prophets, workers of great evil instead of great good. The thing is, we're looking at two, at two levels here. Those who don't use the power and authority that they have been given by God, and those who do, but end up serving masters other than the one true God. You see, all true power, all true authority, that power and that authority which creates and heals and does good instead of evil, it comes from the Lord who is revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures by our tradition, by our experience, by our reason. All other power, all other authority is either a corrupted version of this true power, this true authority, or it's the power and the authority that comes from somewhere else, from pure evil. In Deuteronomy, when the people of Israel were promised a another prophet like Moses. They're told that they should heed that prophet and do all that that prophet says because what this prophet says comes from God. But the thing is, they're also told to beware of false prophets. Of those who speak in the name of other gods or who presume to speak in the name of God, a word that God has given to them, they're warned, to say it another way, not to listen to people who just sound good, but people who, in addition to teaching what God has taught, teach what God has not given them, teach something extra. They're warned not to listen to those people who teach and who speak for False gods. But how do we know? How do we know who those folks are? Well, the book of Deuteronomy, in fact, the entire Bible, also proposes tests that we can apply to those who claim to speak for God. Tests which determine whether or not they do or whether they speak for something or someone else. First, the word which they speak must come true. If they say something or predict something, it must happen. Second, the word that they speak must not contradict other words that God has spoken. Third, the word that they speak must glorify God and not themselves. And fourth, and this might be the most important, the person who says that they speak for God must produce, listen, good fruit. Jesus himself warns us in the Sermon on the Mount that a false prophet often does many mighty works, works that can include healing, but that the fruit that they produce is ultimately evil. It's ultimately wicked. They're wolves in sheep's clothing because their good deeds are like false advertising meant to encourage us to buy something that we don't really need. All of this deals with the topic of those who actually exercise power and authority and whether or not it's a godly power, a godly authority that they show forth. But, what about the other situation? And I think this is the one that most of us would probably resonate with the most, the the one that most of us would probably feel like we ourselves would fit in. What about the situation in which so many Christians seem to find themselves powerless? Having no authority. No influence over evil. No ability to change things around them. As I said, it's a matter of management. It's a matter of who's doing the leading. 
It's a matter of who is in control. In the gospel reading for today, we see a man who's possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. Now, the people around this man had to have known what he needed. I mean, demon possession, I don't know, it it seems to me like it would be pretty obvious stuff. Those who are possessed are no longer in control of themselves. They're sick, not in the way that we normally think of sick, but, but sick nonetheless. And it causes them to do things that they wouldn't normally do or that they don't want to do. To behave in ways that they don't want to behave. And so those around this man had to have known, had to have known, that he needed to be healed. They knew what he needed. To have that evil spirit, that demon cast out, but none of them can do it. I can almost hear them. I can almost hear them saying to one another, you know it's too bad about old George over there. Somebody should really do something about it. I don't know, folks. Sounds a lot like what we tend to say about a lot of situations. Someone should do something about violence in the schools. Somebody should do something about hunger in developing countries. Somebody should do something about the rampant spread of preventable or treatable or curable diseases. Someone should do something about battered women and human trafficking. Someone should do something about all the children living in poverty and squalor. Someone should do something. And then Jesus came. And he commanded the demon to come out of the man. And it did. The spirit obeyed him and the man was healed. Why? Because Jesus had the authority. Jesus had the power needed to make a difference. He had the authority and the power of God. A power that can alter any circumstance. A power that can heal any person. Jesus still has that power and authority. And he gives it to us. Jesus still has that power, still has that authority, and He gives it, He offers it to us. He calls us to use it, to do the work of God in this world. He calls us to employ it, to heal, and to teach, and to bring justice, and to grant mercy. When we put ourselves, listen, when we put ourselves, yield ourselves to Jesus' disposal, when we go forth to speak not our word but His word, when we act according to the teachings that He has given us, when we pray and search the Scriptures and ask God to use us, even us, To accomplish the divine purpose, the demons around us will begin to disappear. The trick is, we need to get in tune with what it is that God wants us to do. What it is that God wants us to say. The thing is, this requires that we spend a large amount of time seeking out the will of God. It requires a commitment to God. Listen, folks. It requires a commitment to God that is equal to or greater than any other sorts of commitments that we might make. It has to be greater than the commitment to watch a football game. Ooh. It has to be greater than our commitment 
to enjoy our favorite hobby. It has to be greater than the commitment that we make to spend time with friends. It has to be greater than the commitment that we make to do anything else. Our commitment to God is first and it is foremost. And if it isn't, we will never hear, we will never know what it is that God wants us to do, who it is that God wants us to be, period. We must be invested in our listening and in our responding. We have to be attentive for the call of God if we're going to hear it. Moreover, we have to actually heed, listen to, respond to the call that we hear. And when we heed that call, we must do so with the authority that God in Christ has given us. So what it comes down to, church, the summary, the summary of it all is this. We've got to give up trying to do what God asks us to do our own way. Instead, we must seek to discover what it is that God wants us to do and to do it God's way. What God wants us to say, where God wants us to go, when God wants us to act, and to do it God's way. Because when we do, we will begin speaking and acting with the authority of Christ. And dear friends, there's no limit to what God can do through those who exercise this sort of authority. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.